Gabriel, yeah. I suppose we'd better start at the beginning. What age did you be decide to be a doctor? And, and, and I, decide when, I decided to become a doctor when I was uh, 16 in a Latin class, just dreaming a while. So, as a matter of fact, uh, I uh, belong to a medical dynasty. A medical dynasty, yes. Dynasty, yes, 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 yes. Four professors, I'm the fourth professor of medicine of the Faculté de Paris. And the big man of our family has been my grandfather, who was Nobel Prize awarded. But out of 23 of his grandchildren, I was the only one who was involved in medical tea, in medical studies. And uh, you know, uh, to a man like this one, it was the glory, the honor of the family, but what a burden upon the shoulders of a teenager, a normal teenager. This was the Nobel Prize winner. Yes, this photography is, shows how he worked in his private library. Right. When you were a medical student, yeah. I think you told me you had certain views about how medicine was being taught. Yes, 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 yes. And, you know, I didn't know exactly if it, it was good, well done, or not. But during my first year as a medical student, I went to Hotelieu, and there I had to take care of just minor things to do with a patient who was a patient of my age. A drunken girl, a stab in the groin, rupture of the uh, femoral artery, ligature, and the gangrene, gangrene, and afterwards amputation and streptococcusepticemia. One day, the big boss, some... When you say big boss, you mean the patron, the, the, yes. the head surgeon. Yes, 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 exactly. The head of the Department of Surgery, one of the first in Paris, came and performed himself that has never been seen, an intravenous injection of a new drug. It was the first ethanomide. But he didn't know that to cure the patient, he had to make many, many shots, intravenous shot, four or five a day, and to treat the patient as well as mice in the experimental laboratory. Yes, and he, he only gave one injection? Yes, the right. patient died, and I was very sad, disappointed during all, by the souvenir during all my studies. And many often I thought, should I change to another occupation? You got, you got to know this patient of yours very well. Oh, yes. He, I was of my age. Every day I try to give him my compassion. And uh, I don't know if I've given anything to him. I'm sure you help. It's difficult to say. <laughs> I think we both qualified in 1939. Yes. What happened to you during the war? Well, it was... The, the usual the usual things that young men as I did, French young men as I did, drafted with a, so not severely wounded at all, not severely wounded, prisoner of war for six months, freed according to the Convention of Geneva. Afterward, I became back, I went back to my, to my job in the hospital as an intern and doing more or less underground work at the same time. When, after Paris has been delivered. When Paris was, was freed. 
freed, yes, in at the end of August 1944. Uh, I volunteered, and I was badly wounded in you Alsace. You joined, you joined the French army? Yes, right. yes, I joined the French army, mm. and uh, in Alsace I have been badly, badly wounded, and afterwards I joined again the army, and I fought in Germany, and then the war was over. Well, the end of the war was over. Just a minute. You were decorated too, weren't you? What? You were decorated too, weren't you? Yes, yes, yes. It was. I have been. I would say lucky, because at the beginning of April, we had a bloody affair. The day before General de Gaulle visited the army, and one cross of night of Legion d'honneur was given to our commando. This was, this was, you had a ration for that, for the regiment had done well, and you had a ration of one Légion d'honneur. Yes, right. only one was given to this, to our group. Right. And the, the unfortunately for the other officers, and Légion d'honneur is given only to officers in these circumstances, they all were killed or severely wounded. You were the only survivor? A, and intact, <laughs> because they were all the survivors, but not intact, is that not? <laughs> oh. Right. Yes, well, that's one form of luck. Now, um, much of your life was interwoven with Jean Ambourget. I how, well, wait, wait, wait. How, how did you come to meet him? I met him just after be I became intern in 39. And uh, he had impressed me a lot because he was one of the rare MD I knew who, started, who introduced, who introduced experimental facts in clinical reasoning. In clinical reasoning. Reasoning, yeah. Reasoning, sorry. And uh, for that, he. I asked him an interview, in the, and he invited me for dinner. We, we spoke together for two or three hours, and uh, war broke out a couple of weeks after, and I met him again in 50, in 46. What was he like? I always thought of him as rather austere sort of character. Yes, he was austere, maybe to a certain extent, because he was entirely devoted, devoted to what he made and what he thought important. I would say maybe he was earnest. Earnest. Earnest, earnest yes. Considering exactly the same as earnest as bedside, as organi hospital organization, in writing, and any other activities. But I took care of two or three of his schoolmates, and they told me that it was full of fun then. And I would like to try to show you why to show you how he behave in uh, a, dinner, a dinner offered by the lower staff to the senior staff just to pull their leg. Mm -hmm. And uh, look at this. Okay. It was very, it's, it's funny. He looks, he smiles, and we spent a very agreeable evening at the Salle de Garde of Hôpital Necker. After the war, you joined en Bourges uh, at the Necker in 1951. Yes. What was the Necker like when you joined it? Necker, Necker was a lovely hospital, con if you consider only the courtyard. Look at the courtyard. It's the courtyard. Courtyard. It's like a, a common courtyard. But inside the buildings, it was absolutely dreadful because we had only two wards 
and two walls with uh, 30 beds in each of them. And uh, not only two walls, but we are only two doctors, two MD, and two interns to make the job, to do the job. And uh, I would like to show you another photography, another picture. And in this picture, you could think that the group was very important. As a matter of fact, the only row, the only row, the only first row was made of doctors. All the others were nurses and medical students. All the other people, there are four rows of doctors, of uh, medical students and uh, nurses. But among the first row, 10 person, five of them became professors of medicine. I gather that from the start, the department was for patients with kidney diseases. Is that right? Yes. Yes, it was right. Yes, it was right. We start with kidney diseases. Not entirely. We start of kidney diseases because our names, and especially Hamburger names, attracted kidney diseases. But we, we receive any other common patients, any other common patients. And uh, unfortunately, and it was exactly the same everywhere in our hospitals as nephrology was just on the point of uh, being born and the uh, ne uh, medicine, general medicine, welcome nephrological patients. Mm. So you were really a general medical ward that took in a lot of kidney patients? Yes. What were, and the, we, what were the outstanding renal problems at that time? It was acute renal failure. Acute renal failure for one reason, because we had intestinal dialysis. Intestinal dialysis? Intestinal dialysis, right. you're right. right. Uh, but um, these patients, the patients we treated then had almost disappeared. It was carbon chloride, carbon tetrachloride intoxication, mercury intoxication, mismatch transfusions, sepsis postoperative, and postoperative. The only one that remained, that remains now, is postoperative sepsis. And we treat them with intestinal dialysis. That was more or less tricky because it's difficult to manage at the same time the active transfer and the passive transfer within the gut from the lumen of the gut to outside or reverse, or vice versa. <laughs> As a matter of fact, one of, we had a special patient whose name was Simon, whose Christian name was Simon, but her family name was more important. She was called De La Vie. <laughs> and she had a postpartum sepsis. And she became an Uric, and she became an Uric, and she was transferred to Paris, more than 400 kilometers from Paris. And she, received, she was an Uric for 33 days. She was treated with intestinal dialysis for 13 days. And she recovered. It was very interesting because is Must she have had you great confidence to be able to do that. Yes, yes, because first it was really the first patient in which for whom we were absolutely sure that without dialysis she would have died. And the <laughs> We, uh, we had with her a, a one hilar hilarious case. Oh, yeah, is, you had a, another patient. You had another patient who was hilarious. No, no, it was this one. Right. It was this one patient. On the second day, she pulled out the inter intestinal tube. 
Hombuge, the recessive sleigh, warned her husband. And uh, the husband, the husband came back to a wife's bed, slapped her face twice, and said, bringing you to Paris was very expensive. You have to bear the doctors in order to, cure, to, to come back home and run the farm with me. This was an old-style psychological treatment which saved life of a mother of four children. That's Simone, right. Yes. Well, she went back and she was well. Exactly. Obviously, yes. the department was heavily involved in research. What were your particular yes. interests? I was only interested in clinical investigation because it was the only field in which we could work. And I noticed two unknown facts at that time in anuric patients. What one was acute erythropenia. And we, I discovered that in the bone marrow of our anuric patients, erythroblasts disappear after one or two or three days of anuria. And it reappears spontaneously 10, 15, or 20 days later. And um, this was before Jacobson has shown that the metaphoretic factor described by Carnot in 1906 came from the kidney. You, you have a picture of that uh, experiment yes. of yours, haven't you? Yes. yes, you know, you can see here, you can see here the the decrease in erythroblasts in some patients in which we had two or three, two or three bone marrow examination, the erythroblasts count de descend almost till zero and climb again afterwards. Good. And what was your other project? My other project was to study endogenous water. Endogenous water, right. Yes. Endogenous water. We have been very impressed by the fact that our anuric patients lose their weight after they began diuresis, just when the shift between catabolic state and anabolic state appeared, and more important when they began to eat and to drink ad libitum. And for that reason, we study, we, we wonder from where came that this, uh, this extra weight. I it mean, that, that, be that example of yours, how, how much weight was lost there? The 10 kilos 10 from kilos. a woman whose, whose weight, usual weight, was 56 kilos. Right. That means 17% of a weight. It's a very important, yeah, yeah. important disintegration of the body mass. Where do you think all this water was? It came from proteins, carbohydrates, and most like lipids. Oh. And, uh, but where it went? That's where, a where problem. Was where was it? Where was it? And that's a problem. Mm. It, is still, it is still unknown. But as there were no edema, no hypertension, no blood volume increase, we suppose it is accumulated within the cellular, within the cells. I believe it was about this time that at the Necker, in the department in which you were working, the concept of an intensive care ward, the whole business of intensive care, first saw the light of day. How, how did this emerge? Yes, the August 52 has been a very busy month. We had to treat a lot of patients with anuric, and we had a lot of non-renal problems. And some of our patients 
had died, had died from these non-renal problems. When Hambourget came back from vacation, we, I, I wondered him account of what happened. And he told me we should gather all the means to overcome a lethal situation due to the, uh, the arrest of a, a vital function. And he wanted to gather all the knowledge existing at that yes, time, yes. how to deal with yes. these and he, he, he wants to call this book Reanimation Medical, and it is now known as Intensive Care. Mm. Intensive Care. It was very important. And he sat. I will never forget the two hours I spent with him for building the book. He sat on the table, took a paper, and draw a list, and draw a list of uh, the chapters. And uh, I would like to show you the book. It is here. It is ridiculous now because intensive care unit has changed so much. Anyhow, it was the first thing done in that field in France. It the consequences were very important. As a res it resulted on a new organization of our unit, it, cr it made possible the creation of post-operative intensive care units. And more important, maybe, it changes the minds of many French physicians. Tell me about the first renal transplant in a healthy but anephric subject. Yes, the name of this bo of this 15 years old boy was Marius Renard. He was apprenticed to a woofer. He fell from his scaffold. He had a traumatic rupture of the right renal pedicule. He fell off a roof. Yes, a roof, right. scaffold from the scaffold. From the scaffold right. If you want to be precise. And um, the kidney he had an nephrectomy of this kidney, but this was a single one. She was he was transferred to Necker, and we were unable to do anything. We had no chronic dialysis, not even a single artificial kidney. His mother insisted for giving one of the kidneys. Of the blood groups were more or less favorable within the limit of the, of the knowledge of the day, we accepted. And the boy was transplanted on the Christmas Eve, one week after the accident. And uh, I would like to show you this diapositive to let you see how the family was happy. Marius is smiling, and the mother too. This is, this is the day or two after the operation? Yes, the day after the operation, or two days later. And uh, second, we, for 22 days, we had a good, a rather good result. That means that your adherence remain almost around 15 cubic centimeters a minute. It's enough to survive, even if it is not perfectly well. And we learn that we could have paid attention to this fact from the right beginning. But it was a first. <laughs> it was a first transportation. We had no experience of the, this kind of cases. Did he pass a lot of water? What? Did he pass a lot of water? Yes, between uh, two and three cubic centimeters a, a minute. 
Well, that's what. That's yeah, that means one that's liter. Three liters be a between day, yeah. between the two, three, and four liters. Maybe we, we push a little bit. <laughs> so that was from being anuric. Yes, it became three it, liters a day. It, in yes, it's. Uh, uh, on the 22nd day after the transplantation, mm -hmm. abruptly, Anuria recommend, uh, begin again, complete, reappeared, complete reappeared and the kidney was hard and uh, The surgeon went in again. Painful. Yeah, the was, surgeon went in again. Yeah. Well, it was very easy. And the surgeon looked at the kidney to make sure that there were no troubles on no trouble on renal artery. And the patient died some days later. This case raised a terrific and I would say wonderful emotion all over the world. And we received a lot of letters. And when the boy was killed, de died, at his funerals, they were, oh, they were, I don't so know how many, how many uh, hundreds of flowers sent from different countries of Europe, even from Asia, ordered uh, and certainly, it was a very important fact. Moreover, this transplantation has been the first one absolutely perf as perfect as the experimental procedure done by the experiments done by Dempster in England and Simonsen in Dane. In, in Dansk. In Dansk. Oh. And uh, why it was perfectly interesting? Because it was free of chronic uremia. There was no pre-existing disease with a, a circulating of a supposed nephrotoxic. No surgical mishaps no infection of the urinary tract, thanks to our surgeons who anastomosis, who anastomosed the ureter, the donor ureter, to the bladder of the, to the bladder of the boy. No stenosis or thrombosis of the renal artery. Our conclusion that it was a true and pure immunological rejection. Immunological reaction, yes. And we should have noticed, had noticed some warning, warning signs, minimal protein and a slight increase of the blood pressure. At the scientific point of view, it created another mind. And John Merrin, who was interested and who had tried to some transmutation and chronic renal failure, who was with Peter Medawal in London, flew across and came, and it was the first time I met him, and it became a friend. That's when you first met John Merrill? Yes. Right. Well, you knew him quite well. You went to Boston, didn't you? Yes, I went to Boston. You know, uh, some months later, Hospital Nikkei was ready for hemodialysis. We had new premises, uh, premises and uh, uh, the question was to have an artificial kidney. So I, we decided, Homer and I, that I should go to Boston for learning Mary's expertise, my expertise. It was two marvelous months. For, the, for many years, 
I had no routine work. It was the I first time for many years. <laughs> yes. Thought I had time for reading and thinking and spoke with many colleagues whose would have been different from mine. And it was wonderful. I learned a lot of things and I became a true adult nephrologist. John had arrived at a turning point of his medical life. Biochemistry of uremia, he was no longer interested. Kidney diseases, he knew that there were many different, and I remember that with his, during his rounds, we discuss things like that. It is a, which kind of glomerulonephritis it is. And he was ready for kidney biopsy, indeed. And he was ready, too, for transplantation. But he thought that the only possibility was then identical twins. And moreover, socially and intellectually, we were very close one to the other. And I accompanied him in Squirrel Island in Maine and at many wine and cheese parties. <laughs> I think you've got a picture of the first artificial kidney at Nick here. Yes, 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 I got a picture what, of what, it. What, what sort of kidney was that? Uh, it was a terrible, it was something like an elephant kin, artificial kidney. <laughs> it was a rotating cough kidney with a big drum, with a big drum. It took two hours to use, it, to prepare it for the run, but the result was marvelous. <laughs> we changed the, the chance, the prognosis of acute anemia for 20 percent survival to 80 percent survivors. And uh, it was very unpatient, poor in yeah. these kind of patients were referred to us even from Africa after two months. Yeah. What then became the main research interest in the department when this happened? Yes, my main, the main research at the moment was kidney biopsy. Obviously, obviously I've heard the Cox group in Chicago giving their results, and we decided, with the help of René Habib, uh, the pathologist, well-known renal pathologist, who was just beginning, <laughs> her knowledge uh, experiment of expertise in kidney diseases to make a biopsy in all of our patients except those in which where the biopsy will be risky. And as a matter of fact, two years later we had a war we knew but there was a world of various nephor uh, global nephritis, and we had seen almost all of them. And then Paul Mickelson was in Paris. Who, Paul Mickelson, yeah? Yes, from Louvain, you know yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. He was in Paris, and he ran the electron microscopy. Well, Mickelson wasn't an electron microscopist. Yes, but he was a fellow in the department, and he stood two years more in Paris, learning electron microscopy at Collège de France, oh, I see. and afterwards doing electron microscopy for renal diseases. As a matter of fact, Necke was a cradle of new, the new renal nosology, for me, new renal nosology. However, I wrote, I read in SIBA Foundation meeting in 61 that uh, concerning 
renal biopsy, that many men, many pathologists did not think it could help mm. for anything in nephrology. And first of all, first of all, I remember a plea for considering only a bright disease instead of many, many kidney diseases. And the conclusion said by an eminent, uh, eminent pathologist of Baltimore, John Hopkins, who said that he won't, he didn't believe that it could help the progress of nephrology. I remember I was at that meeting, I do. You were at that meeting? Yes. What was your, your main research interest? Uh, my main research interest at the time with the time with uh, the moment I had uh, when I was free time was uh, to try to understand protein hypercatabolism. And I did it with Raymond Adayou, which was his thesis. And we tried to study, to measure the serum protease in patients and to compare. Serum protease in the blood? In the blood, yes, mm -hmm. in the serum. And we compare the level of serum protease in the blood and the protein catabolism of the patient. Mm -hmm. It was rather, maybe it was rather easy in patients with uh, uh, anuric, during an anuric phase, because he, he keep for himself all his urea. And for that, we used, we, we, we used to measure triglycine peptide as activity in blood, in serum. And as a matter of fact, they, they proved to, uh, to, to gather all they, they moved together. They moved together, Pretty yes. Activity, they moved together, yes. Metabolism, all moved yes. together. Yes, but we were not biochemists. You didn't know which was the chicken and which was the egg. Exactly, the yeah. cause and the consequence we ignore and we still ignore. And I regret it because I think that protein catabolism is a general, a general fact that is very important in clinical medicine in any kind of severe disease. But this work, this study, had a very good result. Raymond Adayou became one of my best fellows and he is still working at Hôpital Tenon after a very brilliant career. Good. Now I think we come to the first International Congress of Nephrology in 1960. You were the secretary. Yes, I was secretary general and uh, <laughs> I, I don't understand how naive I could be in accepting this job, this position. Our, fortunately, we had a very good sponsor, the Société des Eaux des Vions on the Lake of Geneva, a resort on the Lake of Geneva, who, take, who took care of finances and all material organization just to be sure to have a good meeting, they, they gave us money for having 20 invited guests, and all of them were, their accommodation were free. I remember, and I was one of them, I remember. I, yes. And we had these tenor voices on the program. So we gathered very easily for 100 scientists. Um, 400? Yes, from ordinary members. They were gathered for one reason. The scientific program was interesting. 
but all of them were guests of the Société des Eaux de Vion. It was, as a matter of fact, a scientific success. Could you imagine that during two days and a half, the duration of the Congress, there was, they heard what was the situation for the renewal, renewal of micropuncture of the tubules, the urine acidification processes, the natriuretic factors, the cells, mesangial cells seen at the electron microscope, the, the list of value, the inventory, the first inventory of glomerular lesions, endemic bulk nephritis. Bulk nephritis, yes. Yes. Mm. Analgesic nephritis, the first result of chronic dialysis and the first results of the first transplantations. It was just a turning point. Um, it was so important that a new clone was born. Its name was nephrology, a word created in the middle of the 19th century and exhumated by Jean Amburger. Oh, I see. I always thought Amburger invented the word. Yes. No, no, it is not right. It appears in Literary's Dictionary, 1862. As what? The study of the kidney? Studies of the kidney disease, right, of right. kidney diseases. Right. But my, I had some troubles. Mm. Now, now tell me, you then had the International Society of Nephrology. Yes. Uh, was formed. Yes, but before I would rather I, I, I will rem uh, remind you the troubles I had, the diplomatic troubles. Oh, yes, the places of the seat of the banquet. I made a lot of errors, <laughs> of mistakes. They were fortunate, fortunately, nobody, uh, no more the, uh, is against me. You sat me next to a Japanese, I yeah. remember. Yes, yes, yes. And the Soviet delegation I've, I had written to the Soviet, in the Soviet Union, asking for their presence at the Congress. They never answered. But at the morning of the Congress, a delegation of 15 persons, 15 uh, arrived and insisted to present a paper, and um, it was a paper they presented on their request was only the natriuretic effect of mercurial diuretics. Mercury, natriuretic effect of mercurial diuretics? Yes. All right, 1960. 1960. Mm. No comment. Uh, well, now tell me about the formation of the International Congress. Of we the had Congress. a business meeting and um, the birth of International Society of Nephrology was a difficult, in difficult delivery indeed. A very small minority supports the idea put on the table by Jean Burger. Those in favor were brought from Prague, Czechoslovakia, Merrill from Boston, and uh, the one uh, from London. Very astutely, astutely, Hambergé shift from the society to the venue of the next Congress. He was having difficulty setting up the... the yes, society. yes, he, he thought, knew... Let's, it, let's concentrate he on Congresses, yes. He perceived all the difficulties. Prague was chosen. Um, if a new... A new Congress should be, will be organized, so organized, so the International Society of Nephrology should be founded. First step. Second step. If the International Society of Nephrology do exist, does exist, it is obvious that it should have a journal. Nephron, 
was then created on the spot with George Shannon and I as editors. No, what who, was that like? What was being editor of Nephron yes. like? <laughs> it took three years from the Society and Nephron to take off. And Nephron, Nephron was a success. Its distribu distribution was 1,500 in 72. Jean Dormont was the nuts and bolt of the operation. No, not exactly that. The nuts and bolt of the operation were carried out by Jean Dormont. And in 1972, we changed, the society changed its publisher, and it has been obliged to change the name, and Kinney International was born then. And I would like to say that all this discussion underlines the fact that nobody would oppose to Jean Ambuget, who was the mainspring of all these enterprises. Very good. Well, now you left the Necker in 1961 yes. to head up your own nephrology department at the Hôpital Tenon. Now, yes. why did you leave? Oh, for a very simple reason. I was 44. And time had come to build up an independent nephrological team. And I must confess that to build such a team has been my first and my principal aim for, this, for decades, before the before, Tenon and after. after. Uh, I, take, I take it with, that with the example of Nick Air in mind, Tunnel, the, the authorities at Tunnel had everything prepared for you, yes? Yeah, not at all, not <laughs> at all. You know, I moved from a castle to a run-down cottage. And it was, Tunnel has been built at the end of the 19th century, and I have a picture at the beginning of the century, and. At that period, the tunnel was exactly as it was in the 60s when I arrived, right. except one thing, the public urinal was no <laughs> more <laughs> there. <laughs> That's gone. And second, the wall has been replaced, the prison wall yes. has been replaced by a fence. But, uh, but uh, I had an intellectual asset. It's very important. That means two fellows, Raymond Dayou and Claude Amiel. And they were very close to me, and we decided to take the rough with the smooth. And we worked immediately. And get on with it. And uh, a special building was put up, named Pavillon Castel. I'm quite sure you don't know who was Castaigne, but Castaigne was in turn in at the end of the preceding century. The end of, of the end of and the end of 19th century right. in Tenon, and in this place he major normal excretory function by the excretion of methylene blue. Yeah. That was that was quite something. That yes, was the first yeah. time, yes. The point of phone calls. What what were the research aims of the department? Oh I make a distinction between the research aims of the department and, and your own. Yes. <coughs> yes, it's a very you know, I we when we arrived we had one project. Amiela, you and I, to study a urine acidification produced by acute hypercalcemia without acid charge. That means it was a 
tubular modification, a tubular modification for unknown reasons and still unknown. Well, we are working uh, with calcium. Yes, an injection of calcium, intravenous injection of gluconate calcium or chloride calcium may, uh, after this injection, the pH of the urine decreases between of yeah, two point. units, of two units in less than 30 minutes, 30, 40 minutes. It's a tremendous change in acute dimension, which explain that in prolonged hypercalcemia, you could have a metabolic alkalosis in some. And the second project was to study uric acid excretion. We study this by simultaneous injection of labeled uric acid PEH and K and following the excretion of these constituents, these solutes of urine. And we could demonstrate in this way that the way there was the way intravenal co-circuits explaining, explaining that uric acid arrives after K, but before pH in the urine. You said intravenal short circuits? Yes. In a different path? Yes. Right. And the last thing we studied at the time was a potent uricosiric called benzodiarone, increasing the clearance of uric acid to that of inulin. Tell me, what, what were your own, your own projects? Yes, my own project. Oh, yeah, these were my projects. We have right, yes. done it. I've done it exactly with other you and I, yeah. But at that time... But you had some that were more yeah, personal. Yeah, I shall tell you afterwards. It's the next... I suppose we could, we could finish with that period. Right. It's yes. the arrival of Liliane morel Marger, now striker. She was a young medical, uh, a young student, pathologist, wanting to be to become a pathologist, and she immediately has done a wonderful job. And since then, Tenon was one of the houses where renal pathology was done at that time, and why? Because there was a good laboratory of pathology. She implemented all new techniques when they appeared. And besides that, there was a very good clinical team with, with a research mentality. And moreover, <coughs> there was good physicians Pierre, there was a very good immunological group, too, run by one of your former fellows. And the biology laboratory was very active. And almost all the physicians were there, were, there, uh, were in the laboratory of biology, uh, of biology working for one in one question on the other. That made the results that we had an independent institution, a small but beautiful, small but beautiful, with a variety of groups. So there was no competition between the groups, but they gather to improve the, the researchers. Also, you were also always uh, all the same corridor, weren't you? Oh, yes. You were right near each other. Yes, we were not, exactly, time. exactly. We had 300 meters of laboratories, mm -hmm. uh, that improved what um, became greater some years later.
Now tell me about your own. I'm, I'm interested in your own uh, personal yeah. research. Uh, my own, my own problems. Yes, my my activity first. It was an administrative activity. When you head of a clinical unit with at that time eighty beds, specialized beds, with research laboratories, you have an heavy, an heavy burden of administrative work. And moreover, I had teaching. I, sh I had to teach at the medical school. And for my group, and I had to provide an intellectual nurture to it, organizing lectures with invited speakers. Because we dis I didn't want to have an inbreeding in my unit. And I had to organize two clinical pathological sessions, BIPC sessions, once a week, and discussions on special topics. For instance, at the beginning of our dialysis unit on and our transplantation, we had a weekly, a weekly meeting for resolving some problems and letting know to the other members of the group what was going on in this field. Uh, and at last, my personal pleasure is to teach at the side. Is to teach at the side. Why? Because I suppose it's the best way to check and refresh the knowledge of maker students and of the intern too. As well, and to insert my the way I do it, to insert was to insert in each case under discussion some new scientific information, and more and at last and maybe the most important, to teach clinical method that is so frequently forgotten at present days because science is everywhere in medicine, but you have still to know what a clinical method is, to use it appropriately. I had some research to two problems. The first project was dark cells, and dark cells for the first... Now, wait a minute, Wh which dark cells? Oh, uh, dark cells. It's a cell described by Schoenschover at the end of the 19th century. Well, never mind. Where, where, whereabouts in the kidney? Hey, they are in the distal and collecting tube. Right. And we observed in experimental animals with Mrs. Ajej, who is a, a biologist, mm. And a, a private school, a school teacher as well, we observed that the dark cells had morphological changes when the when they uh, so the animal is submitted to a metabolic alkalosis with sodium bicarbonate or potassium bicarbonate, or to a respiratory acidosis breathing CO2 gases. Yes. Yeah, this was a phenomenal thing, I think. It Wasn't was it the first time that there was a morphological change described with a functional change? Exactly. And the first time, the first demonstration of a connection between physiology and morphology within the kidney. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, the dark cells are sometimes called intercalated cells. Intercalated, yes. Uh, intercalated cells. But the, the matter spread very abroad, <laughs> I would say, yeah, extent, good. extent, and this is now an important problem of renal yeah, physiology. Very, nice first. very good. And your other problem, your other, you had another pet. Uh -huh. You had another pet subject. 
Yes, add another one. It's vasoconstriction of glomerular tuft after intravenous angiotensin explode at scanning microscope. We injected angiotensin II in, in normal in normal and sodium depleted rats and observed the capillary tuft as a scanning microscope. We determined the threshold dose to induce a vasoconstriction. And this threshold dose for obtaining a definite vasoconstriction of the tufts was 100 less than in normal rats. This is opposite. It's very interesting because it is opposite to the effect of angiotensin II on blood pressure. And certainly, there is in the organism different vascular nets which do not obey at the same time on the sa in the same direction. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. How did you stimulate your team? I'm sure you stimulated uh, them. Yes, my stimulating my, my, uh, <coughs> my team is a permanent souci. Concern, worry, worry. Concern, worry. First, before answering your question, I would like to depict what's what my general rule. I try to induce to every new in turn a mental attitude of curiosity. I explain him, I explain them how profitable it is to detect any inconstantasy, clinical or experimental, with the currently accepted theories. Yeah. I repeat, inconstantances, <laughs> clinical or experimental. Yeah. Yeah. They have to second. My second principle was, if any doubt implies, check by yourself in a book, in an experiment, in a control. And the third one, when somebody was eager to study a subject, I never imposed my ideas but at free discussions. Moreover, I try to provide him the necessary means, intellectual tools, and financial support. It's the boss. It's the boss responsibility. And now I can answer your question. Yes, this attitude rubbed off of some of the what proportion impossible to say i'm only aware of some of the successful successful results it's always many of my fellows left nephrology and many obtained high position in different disciplines of medicine in surgery. I've been surprised how many of them became surgeons. <laughs> because I suppose becomes a, because they learn decision in, a, in our unit. Nephrology outside the north, in France, in Europe, and abroad, many people are running nephrology units outside the north came from this hospital, either in clinical nephrology or in research nephrology. At last, I have still, I had, when I retired, a team 
which persist in tunnel. I have to give some names, very sorry, but Ardayou, Verus, Raer, Ronco, Rondo, Ajej, and Bo, and many others. All of them they formed and they because they are running active groups and recruiting young fellows by themselves now. One remark could be interest you. Do you know which one? Guess. This the anarchy at the beginning of our unit that characterized by different various different starting points and now all of these groups converge towards biochemistry of kidney structures in health and disease in animal and human in vivo using biopsies, in vitro cell cultures. And it's very satisfying. And they try to understand how a healthy kidney become an end stage kidney. So your spirit lives on. Yes. In 1981, you became president of the International Society of Nephrology. I yeah. think you enjoyed that. What do you think you achieved during those years? Yes, first of all, I want to say why I enjoy it. Because <clears throat> I have been a founding member of the so International Society of Nephrology, and I attend most of the meetings of the society. And first of all, I had a great advantage. I was the first president of the International Society having a financial asset. You had some money to spend. Yes, I had money to spend, and, Ka and Kine International was doing well. He was making money. So I could organize postgraduate sessions in Tunis and in Lima, Peru. And uh, I could give, provide money for the Congress, for organizing the future Congress. Yeah. And moreover, for giving travel grants for young nephrologists. But my main success, maybe, has been to draw the continent of China into the society. I had a lot of friends in China because there were French universities in Shanghai, and I knew people who studied in Paris and well came back. So I wrote them, and we organized for the society a trip with uh, Priscilla Kinkett Smith as her husband and the Brickers. And we did, we went there, and afterwards the Chinese joined our international society, and there is no more blank on the map of, of the organizing map of the society in the world. The world, you covered the world. Yes, we covered Very the world. Good. But moreover, I had a very great satisfaction in discussing, in discussing a new contract with a publisher. I have talked with you 10 years before, 12 years before, that we should always have a possibility of opening a discussion with the publisher just to know exactly. The publisher of Kidney International. <laughs> yes, right. the publisher of Kidney International. And we discussed a new contract um, at my demand. The following sentence was included 
in clause 15. Atom formal request from the society, the journal account may be subject to auditing. It's short, but as a matter of fact, some years later, it proved to be very useful for the society. You've described so well the prolonged battle between fundamental science and its acceptance by clinicians. Now the battle is between reductionism and integration. Would you agree that clinicians are in the middle of this battle? Yes, uh, I would agree, certainly, even if it is difficult to manage. On one hand, new techniques, chemistry, physics, biology, and molecular, and molecular biology and molecular chemistry extend the field of clinical investigation. On the other hand, clinical investigation and therapeutic dream. Therapeutic dreams provide new ideas and new concept which must be followed. And that means that the true nephrologist should permanently refresh the scientific knowledge. This they often do, and for that reason, they are among, amongst the leading nephrologists, the leading physicians. Mm -hmm. That's just what I want to say. So, yes, yes, since you retired, you've written several papers on the history of nephrology. And the clinical science, I and saw that uh, nephrology grew up under the wing of biology. Clinical signs of nephrology exist since 150 years, described by Wright, Christensen of Edinburgh, and Rea and Pais. Um, all the, the book of these three leaders were published before 1842. But the meaning of these signs were absolutely unknown. And it was the work done during the 19th century, the rest of the 19th century, and, the, and after. And what has been done at that time during the last century is a mine of experiment showing how science and physiology are interwoven, and they have to be disentangled. Disentangled. Yeah. That means that history of nephrology is a must to understand what is going on in this field. And I found that to track the footprints of nephrology, exciting, interesting, and a pleasure. Also, You're very good at it, too. Yeah. They're very good articles. Yeah. Well, now, yes, go on. I think you want to close with a few words about two of your friends. Uh, yeah. Yes, but I shall speak French because there are two yeah. French friends of mine, and I know you will, you will uh, translate it in English. Yes, I'll, I'll also speak Jean Burger. Enfin, tout d'abord, je voudrais vous montrer comment il était à l'âge de 15 ans. Et ça sera la première d'une série de figures. Il est là, assis à la gauche de son professeur de lettres, de son, le professeur principal de sa classe. On le voit bien sur cette diapositive que l'on va vous projeter dans un instant.
Deuxièmement, je voudrais vous rappeler qu'en 1947, à la, au 17 novembre, à la Société française d'urologie, Hamburger a rappelé l'état de la question de la transplantation qui fut l'œuvre de sa vie. La transplantation est chirurgicalement au point, car les anastomoses urinaires sont maintenant parfaites. Et deuxièmement, l'héparine ne lèse pas le rein. Mais en même temps, Hamburger a défini les trois obstacles qui s'opposent à la réalisation des, trans des transplantations et qui devront s'opposer. Une trop longue ischémie, ce qui suppose qu'il faut pr préparer un processus de conservation du rein et y penser surtout à la perfusion à ce moment-là. Connaître les règles de la compatibilité tissulaire, comme on Landsteiner avait découvert les groupes du sang qui ont rendu possible les transfusions sanguines et bien entendu la mise au point de moyens qui s'opposeraient à la réjection immunologique. Je vous rappelle, c'était en 1947 qu'il a annoncé cela. En 52, il y a eu le le drame de Marius Renard, ce jeune anéfrique dont nous avons parlé tout à l'heure. En 62, il y a eu... Qu'est-ce que j'en ai foutu <rire> en, en 59, il y a eu l'homme du milieu de cette projection, vous le voyez bien, est un nommé Siméon qui a été le premier, euh, de, euh, comment pourrais-je dire, jumeau non identique qui a été transplanté <coughs> en France en juin 59. À côté, vous avez le premier jeune homme qui a été transplanté sans chez un parent éloigné, il n'était donc pas un jumeau. Il a été transplanté le 12 février 62 et il est actuellement cardiologiste en Normandie et a été pour un temps député, membre du Parlement français. Et puis, je vous montre Jean Burger devant son le bâtiment qu'il a fait construire et qui a fait de Necker un grand hôpital néphro-urologique. Peu d'années après, il était avec Peter Medawar à Londres et voici la photographie de tous les deux. Et enfin, je montre un deux autres, je monte sa photographie en 4, Jean 92, juste avant sa mort, quand il était président de la société de néphrologie, la, de l'Académie des sciences à Paris, cette prestigieuse société qui a 300 ans d'existence. Et maintenant, pour terminer, la première année du cours dit des actualités néphrologiques, Regardez qui était à droite de Hamburger, c'était son ami le professeur René Mack de Genève, et qui était à sa gauche, c'était Hugh de Warden, que je remercie de m'aider pour cette difficile présentation. Le deuxième, la deuxième personne dont je veux évoquer la mémoire en français, et Claude Amiel. Claude Amiel est mort il y a moins d'un an. 
Je l'ai connu pour la première fois en 1953 quand il était étudiant à Necker. Et nous avons créé tout de suite des liens de travail et des liens familiaux particulièrement étroits. Et je crois qu'entre nous, il a au moins, si ce n'est plus, donné qu'il n'a reçu. Quatre points ont marqué sa carrière. Vous savez qu'il est né en 1930 et qu'il est mort en 1996. C'est d'une part ses recherches scientifiques sur les transferts épithéliaux. Quand il avait été, quand il était jeune interne, je l'avais recommandé à François Morel, qui a eu pour lui le même estime professionnel et humain que j'ai eu pour lui, pour Claude Amiel. C'était un excellent médecin. Et il était professeur de physiologie, et jusqu'à sa dernière année, ses collègues lui demandaient des avis cliniques. Et ce n'est pas fréquent, et il ne faisait pas ça pour lui, pour lui faire plaisir, mais parce qu'il y avait toujours un résultat, une conséquence intelligente dans un avis de Claude Amiel. Claude Amiel, un bourreau de travail, a occupé des responsabilités administratives prodigieuses. N'oubliez pas ce que Claude Amiel a été à travailler auprès de différents ministres, auprès des directeurs de nos grandes institutions de recherche, et chaque fois, son honnêteté foncière et son intelligence et la qualité de son travail l'a fait apprécier. Est-ce que vous, aucun d'entre nous, à la Société internationale de néphrologie, N'oublie qu'il a été le rédacteur, assistant rédacteur en chef de Robinson, puis de Andréoli, qu'il a été secrétaire général de la société, qu'il devait être président s'il avait vécu. Enfin, ce fut un grand universitaire, car il a fabriqué une école il a réuni autour de lui tous ceux qu'il pouvait aider totalement à devenir un grand néphrologiste. Maintenant, mon cher Hugh de Wan, j'en ai fini et c'est à toi d'intervenir pour traduire ces, les vocations de mes deux amis. Tu as très bien fait. Je vais, je vais faire ça plus tard. Oui.